So um, yesterday we started this final chapter here, Problems of Transducer Design. Um, we'll finish it today. This is our last meeting, right? And we talked a little bit about this first topic here, array element interaction. So this is where typically projectors are arrays of individual elements. And um, what you'd expect to happen is that the uh, sound field here is just the superposition applies. That it's just the sum of the two. The f sound fields due to, let's say, two elements. But they can interact. One can influence the sound production of the other and, and, and vice versa. And this uh, leads to a degradation of the, of the array. And this is currently being, in, this is a, a problem at higher amplitudes. And it's currently being investigated. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about, we talked a little bit about this before, that's going to get quantified here, and that's uh, comparison of different transducer mechanisms. Um, so we're looking here at, at uh, as before, with uh, projectors here, transducing electrical energy into acoustical energy. And one way to compare these, to quantitatively compare them, is to look at the uh, pressure on the radiating, or the stress, or pressure, on the radiating faces. So here's a, um, a quantification of this for the different types of mechanisms. Remember, electrodynamic refers to the, a moving coil, the old moving coil technology. Um, electrostatic, you remember that? Um, electrostatic loudspeaker and it's reverse which is the capacitive microphone um, variable reluctance I'm not sure what this is uh, I think I've given some time like I've encountered this before in, uh, in another setting but um, Anyway, this is one method. Magnetostrictive, we just talked a little bit about that. Uh, the favorite of sonar, you know, PZT material, this piezoelectric. And then hydroacoustic, I'll remind you what this is. We're going to encounter it in a moment. So anyway, for various conditions here, this is what you would get for the, the maximum stress delivered to the, to the radiating phase. And you can see here that um, the piezoelectric is the, is the strongest followed by hydroacoustic. The weakest is electrostatic. So this is, again, though you have to recognize, this is just one indicator. If you, may, you may not be particularly interested in the, in the maximum stress, okay? So it all, there, it's, it's, it's up to you what, what you're interested in. As for the examples here, we've seen that at low frequency, volume velocity becomes important. And you remember, that's the, uh, the velocity of the radiating surface times the area. So you could, for s conditions there and these different types of mechanisms, you could come up with a similar list here you know, with, with effort. So it all depends on what, what's, what's important to you, what the problem you're trying to solve. Um, another thing that might be important, you know, it could be that the electromechanical coupling factor but what couples the two, the electro and the acoustic? It could be that that's really important to you. So again, you could come up with a comparison of that. Um, another problem we talked about briefly before, you might remember when we introduced the tone pilch driver, was matching the amplifier impedance to the, um, you know, the, son the sonar device, the, the transducer. We're thinking of projectors here. And you know, it's a general rule. If the, if the impedances don't match, you're going to get reflections. So your uh, efficiency will be cut down here. Um, and you know that our typical projector elements are, they have a, it's not a simple impedance. It's going to be typically a complex impedance. What you want to do there, what it turns out that you want to do is, 
uh, you want to match the impedances between the amplifier and the transducer. You want the com you want the impedances to be complex conjugates of each other. Has anyone ever encountered this before? I've never seen this before. I don't know. This is just stated in the book. Um, and of course, you know, if if you don't if you don't need to drive hard, you don't really care, right? Or you could do what I do. If you're, I'm almost always in a laboratory environment. So if, if I have trouble, if I don't have enough power, my tr my transdu my projecting transistor, I just I grab another amplifier. Okay, <laughs> I grab a bigger amplifier. That's the cheap way out here. But of course, you know, in the field, in the ocean, on a ship or something like that, you don't often don't have that luxury. And you need, you're probably going to design a specific amplifier to go with something. And you can't just grab, like, well, I do. I grab, you know, in a laboratory environment, I can tolerate a large amplifier. It just goes into a rack, or if it's really big, it's next to the rack, and I don't really care. But out in the field, it's a whole different story, right? Um, so taking this a little bit further here, there's, um, we know that, um, Near resonance, a piezoelectric, a PZT projector can be approximated by a blocked capacitance in parallel with an LRC. We've seen this time and time again in this course, right? This is our standard model, that, that, and it works. So um, different people have done different things to match impedance with the amplifier. One is to use a, a it can be the transformer can work. I don't know if this, I don't think that, I have a suspicion this is not always guaranteed, but people have have had some success with this, according to the textbook. Um, another, a little more interesting, I think, is to um, tune out the react. You know, you have a blocked capacitance in there, right? If you add an inductor, and I think we talked about this a little bit before with the Tonpilts, the tuning inductor, remember that in the photograph of the actual physical cutaway of a Tonpilts driver? Um, if you add an inductor in there and you tune it so that you're on resonance, the um, it's like the inductance and the capacitance cancel each other, and I think you're in, you're in a matched impedance situation like that. So that's one. That's another thing that people have done. And then here's my solution. You know, just get a bigger amplifier. <laughs> okay. And you know that's fine in research, controlled research situations, because you want to do things quickly. So that's a standard thing to do. But you don't always have that luxury, and you know often don't have that luxury for at least the deployment of uh, sonar transducers, right? But in the research of them, it's this is you may not be worth your spending time to do this, okay? I just want to point that out. Um, and this, of course, this naturally, we, we just already started talking about this. There's often a huge difference between um, the laboratory environment and the field environment. In our case, in this class, it's the ocean, typically the ocean, sometimes lakes, but usually the ocean. Um, <coughs> uh, one of the big differences is that uh, salt water. Usually in a laboratory environment you deal, not always, but typically you're dealing with fresh water. And in the ocean you've got to deal with salt water. And that can, as you all know, that can cause corrosion, can, can cause all kinds of problems. So you have to pay attention to that. Um, on the other hand, in a laboratory environment you're just naturally more accurate. It's a sort of human nature because you can be more accurate in an experiment. You usually are more accurate. Whereas in the ocean, it's, 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 it's usually much more difficult. So you settle for less. So you might think, well, in a laboratory, why don't you just not go through the effort to make things more accurate? Well, again, it's, just some, it's something in our nature. And I think, it, to me, I see it as a good thing because you're, you're doing research, you're dealing with something that uh, there are aspects of it that no one's probably dealt with before. And you never know what you're going to find. So we usually take um, at least some a moderate effort in trying to be accurate in, in a controlled laboratory because you never know what you're going to find and you may, it, if you're if you're sloppy you may completely miss something and that's happened there are actually some famous cases of that 
Um, The ocean off on a transducer would be submerged for very long times, and that brings up a whole set of problems. You know, can it handle, can it handle a long-term, you know, can it not leak with long, long-term sub submersion, submergence? A standard example is, you know, throwing hydrophones overboard to monitor uh, ship radi you know, traffic, ship radiated noise. So it may be that you need to put in a lot of effort an expense to uh, make sure that the uh, hydrophone maintains its quality, right? And, it, and, if, and if you want accuracy, this can, of course, drift over time, and especially in harsh environments like that. So you have to pay attention to that. Um, and this statement about hydrophones here applies to projectors. Does this, guy, does this look familiar to you guys? This is the F33, that was one of the transistors you used last week in the uh, reciprocity calibration experiment. And I don't know if you know what's inside there. Um, oh, so these things, uh, so they're, so I think a ten, it's inch, uh, 10 inches in diameter, right? And they're pretty heavy. Um, and I can't remember the cost, it's a few thousand dollars at least. It may, ah. Uh, Anybody know? It could be upwards of $5,000. I don't know. So here's what's, uh, there's a bunch of piezoelectric elements. They look like thickness vibrators, don't they, in here? And um, this is, of course, with the cover removed. Now, they're potted in here. That means this is polyurethane. So it's, uh, presumably, it's mixed, and it's kind of like a viscous liquid, and you set, set these in here, and then it hardens, OK? So did you notice that one side, did you touch the thing? The, so it's got this rubber outside cover. And one side's hard, that's this. This is the projection side. And how did it feel to you? Yeah, it's soft, right? What, and what do you think's in there? Take a wild guess. Oil. Oil. Yeah. So, and I, so that's used to couple the sound field and... Um, so, anyway, the next thing you noticed here, you notice, is that there are two different sizes here. Does this look, we, you've all seen this kind of thing before. Just about everybody in the world has seen this. Loudspeaker systems, they're typically, a loudspeaker system for air, typically has different size, you know, loudspeakers, right? There'll be a woofer, a larger one to, to that'll be efficient, they'll pr produce bass well. At the other extreme, there'll be a tweeter, sometimes two tweeters for the high frequency. And then there's a mid-range. So typically these are called three-way speakers. This is a, this is two-way, and this is for the low, lower frequencies, this is for the upper frequencies. And do you just put a signal in here? And you can, you can put a signal in here, and you know, I'm sure this will be better than if you just had one size of piezoelectrics, you know, that just if it's one way rather than two way. But what's the standard thing you do to optimize that? Do you guys, we, I don't know, we didn't talk about this, but I wonder if you guys know this. Oh wow, there's a simple passive crossover network in loudspeakers. It's just, it's a composed of low pass and high pass filters. And it'll send the signal, if it's low frequency, it'll send it here, if it's high frequency, it's, it, sends, it sends it here. There's no abrupt cutoff there, it's just, it's a smooth transition. That's called a crossover network. Has anyone heard, few people have heard of this before? Only one has, has heard of this before in loudspeakers? Wow, okay, well you're hearing about it now, I guess. <laughs> Okay, so it's a simple idea, right? Yeah, it's, and, they're, and they're, I have to admit, I never built one, I just know about them, but they're, and they're, they're simple to, you know, inexpensive. And it can, it help a lot with the sound production here. So anyway, in the end, this thing is, uh, Brian tells us it's one to roughly 150 kilohertz. It's got a range, I think. Of, uh, yeah, so that's a couple decades, that's pretty good, pretty good range. Uh, here's another projector. This is, 
the F-33 can, I think, can be, you can get pretty good amplitude. Here's a more extreme, greater amplitude. This is, uh, I don't know if we know the scale here. Do we know the scale? Uh, cardinal sin, right? Put, you know, put a penny here or some, put something here, right? That's the old standard technique. Is, you guys know that, right? Or, or in the last case, there was a uh, ruler, something like that. Or, and if you can't do that, if somebody has taken, if you're using a photograph that somebody, some, you know, maybe non-technical person has taken and they didn't know, um, you can put it in the caption, right? So this is useful to know for your theses. Right? But we don't, we don't have it here. So what this is, is uh, it's a bunch of elements here, projecting elements, piezoelectric elements, that are at the bottom of each of these um, cylinders here, open-ended cylinders. And it's, it's got an axis of symmetry, so it sends, it's got a, a toroidal type radiation pattern. It's going to send out sound primarily in this direction. And it'll fall off when you go outside the, off the horizontal plane there. And so you wonder, what are these cylinders for? Well, they're tuned probably to, uh, you know, the, the resonance of a quarter wavelength cylinder, uh, uh, the, the resonance for an open closed cylinder here, the fundamental is a quarter wavelength in here. It's not a half, it's because of the mixed boundary conditions. So this length is tuned. It's probably tuned to be a quarter wavelength. So, um, that's going to get you, when you're operating at that particular frequency, very near that particular frequency, you're going to get this boost in amplitude due to the resonance here, due to these little cavity resonances. So this is for operation, narrow band operation. You know, if you want that high intensity, you need to operate right around that quarter wavelength resonance, or a higher order resonance is possible. And of course, you want to take into account the end correction, right? Remember that? Now there are all kinds of other transducer mechanisms. This is true in general. It seems to be particularly true for electroacoustics. That's subject, the main subject of this course. Um, people have come up with uh, all kinds of, there are just all kinds of ideas out there. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but let's just start looking at these. Um, these are, well, let me make a general statement. You want to be aware that there are other things out there because what you may find, one of the reasons is, it's a very practical reason is, you're doing some research and there's, you know, there's nothing commercially available for you, right? You'd like to just, usually, the usual procedure is you, you just buy an off-the-shelf transducer. That's tip, now it depends upon what you're doing, your application, but typically that's what people do, but sometimes it's just not available. You can then go to the literature, or including talking to people, and find out there could be something that's not commercially available, but what you can make, and somebody has researched. You know, part of the acoustical side of America, there's a, it's split up into different sort of acoustics disciplines, right? We might have talked about this in the beginning of last quarter, usually I do like musical acoustics, architectural acoustics, environmental acoustics, physical acoustics, right, such underwater acoustics. <laughs> uh, there's transduction. That's one of the subjects. I, I, I think I might have mentioned that to you. So this is a, you know, there are people who since spend their careers just dealing with transducers. Uh, I've told you that before. So, um, so anyway, you can find literature on something. It may not be commercially available, but, but someone has gone through all the effort to optimize it and come, you know, try to overcome problems. So that's a standard thing to do. Um, if that fails, then, then you can try to be creative. And this is actually, I've done this a few times, it's actually kind of fun. You just start looking you know, for any kind of coupling between electro, you know, any electroacoustic coupling. If there's anything out there that couples the two, where Acoustic, or the um, you know sound wave influences has some electrical influence and vice versa. You've got coupling, and in principle, you can make a transducer out of it. All right, uh, but I got to warn you that it 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 can be very difficult. 
You know, the reason some of these you know, high quality transducers are expensive is that a lot of research and uh, development has gone into them. <coughs> Okay, so the first one here, we talked, we've actually talked about this before. This is where you have pulsed water hitting. Um, it can be realized in different ways. I think here we talk about a piston. You can have a, a stream of water that's pulsed here. This gate, it's, it's open. There's a valve here. It op open and closes. And it impacts some kind of a, a piston, let's say. And this could be connected to some, you know, flexing diaphragm. So if you pulse this, this water has, you know, a lot of momentum here. And by pulsing it, you can generate pretty big forces here. You can get good amplitude. So that's called hydroacoustic transduction. Um, the next one is one that I, I briefly mentioned yesterday, and it turns out I'm going to give you guys a, a better, a deeper description than the high school students. I'd forgotten <coughs> about this. So let's talk about this. Um, <coughs> this, this is interesting. It's inherently nonlinear. Okay, it utilizes nonlinearity. Without nonlinear, uh, 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 if you, if you don't have nonlinear sound, this won't work. It fundamentally depends upon it. And I'll describe, I'll sort of briefly describe this to you. And let me uh, tell you, I think I must have, I think I probably told you this yesterday. In the nonlinear course, we spend a couple lectures explaining this. There's, you have to build up to it and then you, you know, it's at least two lectures. It's, it's complicated. But it's a fascinating device, as you'll see. Here's one right here. This is a commercial device. We tried to build our own. I had a thesis student, part of his thesis. They seem simple. So we got some elements. Um, there are piezoelectric elements here, an array of them. I don't know how many. Oh, you can probably count. Here's where you can see where they're attached here. See these little, can you guys see these little flathead screw things here? That's probably, each of those is probably a piezo. Is my, well, I don't know, they're not completely regular. But I don't know how many are here. This is called an audio spotlight. Um, it's, um, I can't remember the name of the company, but you can Google it if you're interested. Uh, so we tried to make our own and we failed. And I think I mentioned this once before. We, we bought a bunch of piezos that operate in air at a high frequency. And um, there may be a lack of phase coherence there that, that hurt us. So let me, anyway, let me, I never did resolve that. But I still have the piezos. There's <laughs> still mounted on something similar to this. So let me explain how this works, okay? There's, and this is the, the simplest operation of it. The, um, this thing puts out a 65 kilohertz, a, a 60, I think it's 60 kilohertz, 60 kilohertz sound wave. The wavelength in air is like, is very small. So because the wavelength is small, there's going to be very little diffraction, right? So this is going to put out a nice beam. You may wonder, there's going to be some attenuation length, right? And we can actually calculate that. Remember last quarter? We, we went through a theory of that. And I've, I think I calculated once years ago. I think it's roughly, and my experience is it's roughly five meters or something, maybe more, something like that. The inner, the, but this higher frequencies attenuate faster, right? So anyway, it puts out this high, very high frequency wave. We, we can't hear that, right? Um, dogs can't hear it. Cats can, it turns out. And bats, no problem. Bats go up to beyond 100 kilohertz. Um, so anyway, here's the idea. Here's the simplest idea. Suppose that there are you send two frequencies that are two high frequencies that are relatively close to each other. Their difference is an audio frequency. So it could be, you know, 60 kilohertz and 61 kilohertz, right? You send that here. So now you're creating these, creating these high amp, this is high amplitude beams here of sound of two frequencies. What happens with, with nonlinearity is you can, those two frequencies will generate some indifference frequencies. And for you guys, for right now, for here in this class, 
you can appreciate it mathematically. If you have a differential equation, a linear differential equation, then you can use the you get the principle of superposition. You're just going to get these two waves, okay? And for a linear sound, linear sound system. But if you have a squared in there, just take consider mathematically squared. What's going to happen? When you square the two fields here, you're going to get a, 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 the product of the two, right? And that's going to give you, some, it's easily shown from trigonometric identities, that's going to give you some indifference waves. So the sum wave is very high frequency, it attenuates rapidly. But the difference wave is lower frequency, it can go a long way. It gets created not directly from here, but in the column, in the beam here. It's non-linearly produced. It comes from the two primary waves here, the 60 and the 61 kilohertz, which it's coming from this space. So it's actually being produced in the column here. And consequently, it has, a, it has that profile. It has a very narrow um, radiation pattern. It's a beam of sound. It's similar to a laser. So this is... Um, this was discovered theoretically in I think the late 50s or early 60s by Westerfeld. It took about 10 years for somebody to finally uh, successfully make one of these things. And uh, they're routinely used as fathometers to measure depths. You bounce the sound and this, this will you'll see, I'll demonstrate in a moment, It'll, you can bounce sound. This is kind of a small room for this, but um, it's better than nothing. <laughs> So anyway, you can bounce sound off the ocean floor or whatever, and do a, you can do a time of flight or whatever, something like that. Um, and then, in the, starting in the mid to late 80s, somebody took it one step further, okay? They said, well, what if we, this was a company in San Diego, uh, I've forgotten their name now. We have this high frequency wave, right, this carrier. Think, we're not going to think of it as a carrier, the 60 kilohertz. What if you modulate the carrier at a low frequency? Well, when you have an amplitude, an amplitude modulated beam, you can Fourier resolve that into two frequencies that are close to each other. Okay, I, this is just a Fourier analysis. We're going to get this, this is some indifference frequencies here. That's just Fourier analysis. But then, because Uh, because this is nonlinear, there will be some indifference on top of that. Okay, so let me make sure you understand this. When, when you have this mo high frequency modulated beam here, okay, just thinking linearly here, the Fourier resolution of this is going to be two high frequencies that are close to each other. That still doesn't give us anything. But because they're high amplitude, they interact, the difference frequency will be produced. And we can, we can hear it, we can make it so, so we hear that. Okay, so you don't have to put in two separate, you know, just fixed frequencies. You can do the modulated beam and launch this parametrically, it's called a parametrically generated wave, okay? Furthermore, you can change the amplitude and the frequency. You can put, uh, you can put music in this thing. Now there's a big problem. There are two big problems here. The one that, we're in, that happens right here is the fact that if you just modulate this with some audio signal, it gets highly distorted when it comes out. So to make it, to get out what you put in here for the audio signal, you need to pre-distort the signal. And starting in the mid-80s, they came up with high-speed electronics. You know, high-speed electronics was you know, electronics was getting faster and faster, so they, had, they used high-speed electronics to pre-distort the signal so that it goes through this process, the parametric generation process. It gets distorted, but now it's back to whatever the input signal is, okay? Um, the other problem of this is a very big one, and I'll mention that in a minute, but let's go ahead and do the demonstration. I'm going to turn the um, amplifier. So all the pre-distortion electronics is in this special amplifier here. I need to turn it on. Now I'm going to put some music in here. This is the standard tr track of a CD that we've been using for many years. 
And sometimes people think it's out of date. The, the high school students had no problem with it. I was surprised. Let's see what you guys think. Okay. I'm going to turn it down a little bit. So, again, what you're hearing is not coming directly from here. It's coming, it's being produced in the beam, the, the high frequency, high amplitude beam. Now we can hear it. It's about, what it is, it's bouncing off. But outside, the first one I ever heard of this was outside. And we were, I can't remember, this was in the early 90s. Um, we were 50 to 100 yards away. And when this thing swept, when this guy, you know, swept it by us, we could just clearly hear it. It's remarkable. So the Army has been interested in this because this is a way to communicate on a battlefield, to send instructions on a battlefield acoustically. And uh, museums have been interested in this, to give information. Now you can bounce, if some of, uh, we can, this works well in the slant room. So I asked the student, the high school students last Friday, I bounced it off the wall and it was, you know, it's full. The slant room was full. People were on the, and I said, raise your hand if you can clearly hear it. And so there was a group, you know, over here, and just, just with the angle of incidence equaling the angle of reflection. So I don't know if you, I don't know if you guys can hear this, but if I move it along and bounce it off different points there. Okay, now, this has gotten a lot of attention by non-technical people. They think, oh, this could be a non-lethal weapon, right? There's all, you can come up with all kinds of ideas here. But I want to make sure you guys understand there's a serious limitation here, okay? The only way this thing works is you have to have a high amplitude, very high amplitude, high, high frequency beam. And you might say, well, you just increase the amplitude, but you're going, to hit a, you're going to hit a problem. And what is it? What happens when you increase the amplitude of sound? You just keep increasing it? I think we've talked a little bit about this before, maybe last quarter. What? Which resonance? To the resonance point and after that? Well, this is just a traveling wave. We're just generating a traveling wave. As we crank up the amplitude, we're generating a, a traveling sound wave. Eventually, it's going to shock. And that just completely degrades the performance of, of this. The shock, for one reason, once it starts to shock, the high frequency wave will much more rapidly attenuate. So we kind of joke about it in the, in the physics department. Those, the, those of us in the physics department who understand this, uh, some of them don't. And, you know. But um, we, we've all encountered this, people being interested, people in other parts of the campus or outside being interested in, in using this. But the audio amplitude that you get out is severely limited. It's limited by the fact that your primary high frequency here, you can't, you can't let it shock. This could very well be operating near the shock. You know, to optimize this, it's probably, 60 kilohertz is probably close to shocking, is my guess. I don't know. So this is a case where, you know, if you don't, if you treat something like a black box and you say, oh, this is great, I can do all this, you don't, you can do that. And, and everybody's done it, okay? But, you know, often there's no substitute for understanding the physics. In this case, you're severely limited on the, amp the amplitude. So, uh, in the uh, naval people, you, you have what's called LRAD or something like that. You have high amplitude sound that can disrupt people. It's not a parametric array, okay? It's standard, it's just standard acoustics. It's, there's nothing, uh, you know, it's not this weird production mechanism here using a non, using a high frequency beam to get this high directionality. Uh, okay. Now, did Professor Kapolka talk about fiber optic hydrophones in 3452? She does in one of her, she teaches a lot of different acoustics. Did she talk about, you guys are taking 3452. Yeah, we did. Okay. 
Her, her dissertation research might have been in that. I don't, I don't really, did she mention that? I don't know. I can't remember. Um, <clears throat> but these are, I understand that these are, some, are actually deployed in the Navy, the fiber optic hydrophones. So just, we're just gonna look at this kind of lightly. Um, the history of this is kind of interesting. It began, it wasn't all that long ago, but roughly mid 70s. And there were actually two independent groups of researchers. I can't remember where they were. But I do remember one thing. <laughs> uh, a professor here who has since moved on to Penn State, um, he got interested in this and did a lot of research on it in the, um, in the 1980s and into the 90s here at NPS, fiber optic um, hydrophones. So the idea here is um, <clears throat> You have laser light at a definite frequency. And let me go to the diagram that I did here. And you send it along, you split it um, equal, probably equal amplitudes will be good, but I'm sure there's a lot of details here that I don't know anything about. But you split it here and you send it along uh, two different fibers. One is exposed to a, an acoustic wave and one is not exposed. That's called the reference fiber. So what, there are two effects that can happen that the sound wave can cause here. Um, by stressing the fiber optic material, it can change the index of refraction and therefore change the sound, the, um, the, the speed, speed of light. So the idea is, the, and the other one, is that it can change the overall length. It can modulate the length, right? Greater pressure, that's going to get shorter. So those are two, two ind independent effects for, ch for uh, changing the speed of light. So what happens is, when the, when the light is combined here, there can be a phase. The phase can be shifting back and forth due to the sound, at the frequency of the sound wave. And so here's a, what can happen, this is the instantaneous intensity. Okay. What can happen here is that if you've got a half a wavelength, um, if your peak here, uh, if you have a half a wavelength difference, you're going to get destructive interference, right? So at that moment, you'll have the intensity will be zero here. Um, now, you can make these, these are quite sensitive. And there's two reasons why they're sensitive. One, the main one, of course, is this, the, the wavelength of light is going to be really tiny. So it doesn't take much time lag. You know, if the, if the speed of light lags, a little bit in here. It doesn't take much because the wavelength is so small to get this destructive interference, right? So that's one way. Um, another thing that you can make this, that makes this sensitive is that you can wind this. You can take this and wind. You can have a long, your total length of your fiber can be quite long. This is what's done. So the longer it is, that you're going to increase, you know, the effect, the shift there is going to be proportional to the length. So that's another way of making it sensitive. And the, th the thing about fiber optic um, hydrophones like this is they're, they're, they're often too sensitive. They're subject to a lot of noise. Just temperature fluctuations, mechanical vibrations, that can be a problem. So I don't know much about these, but my guess is the way, what you'd want it, the idea of operating it is, you would want to bias this. By bias here, I mean, um, have a little knot, make this a little longer or a little shorter, such that when there's no sound, you'd like to be operating here, all right? So for no sound, if you're in a situation like this where you have a, a phase difference, gives you this interference here and you're there, then when the sound comes along, this will, the sound will cause, you know, like making it longer or shorter or making the index of refraction bigger or smaller. It will oscillate about here and you'll have a linear transducer in this range right here. And it's quite sensitive, right? That's the greatest sensitivity here. 
So that's what my guess is. If you guys know differently, please let me know. This is my guess. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know if Professor Kapolka talked. I don't know what she talked about, what she said about this. I do know she has a demonstration. Did she show you her she demonstration? Really yeah, she loves her demonstration. <laughs> she built that. Um, okay. Now, originally, what people um, looked at was they focused the, on the strain effect, the fact that the strain causes a change in the index of refraction. And then later they got into the, uh, the, the where the change of length was negligible. Then they, they flipped it in later research. And um, think, I think that was the research that was done here. But I do know some things that were done here. I remember seeing this. I was here for a while in the um, early 90s. And I remember there was, um, you can do things, you can take a, um, one of the things they did was they took a cylinder and they had a coil of fiber here and then the reference coil was inside. And so a sound wave would hit this, it would um, stress, the, you know, um, strain the fiber, modulate its length. And so that's one way of achieving what we were just talking about. And here's a this one. Here's an idea that, that Hoffler. Remember, Hoffler is uh, was the transducer expert that taught this course in the 90s, roughly, and a little bit into the 2000s. So he loved this stuff. You take a flex. He took a flexing plate here, and he had one. Uh, maybe I need to go try to go 3D here. So here's one coil of optical fiber. And uh, then there's another one on the bottom. Okay? So I guess I have to... So here's one, here's another. So when this flexes due to a sound wave with this flexing, do you see where this is headed? So when it goes this way, it's going to shorten this one and lengthen that one. So here you have no reference filters. You use reference uh, fibers. Here, you're utilizing both in a push. Uh, this is this word that transducer people love, OK? This is a kind of push-pull. The effect that you're getting with just one of these, you're doubling it here. You get a factor of two. And you don't have to worry about the reference. It's, you don't need a reference here. You just combine the light from these two things and you're getting this, it's getting twice the effect. So that's a so-called push-pull type idea that is often occurs in uh, transducers. We saw it in the electrostatic loudspeaker. Remember the thin membrane and the two perforated plates? That was push-pull. So that you buy a factor of two in the force there. And there you have to do it because this, this is kilovolts. You, you, don't, you want to protect the membrane. It's very delicate, very thin. Um, that's why you get the good high frequency sound is that it responds very quickly. So that was a push-pull idea. So this is very popular in transduction, the whole push-pull. And you can see it, you can see it right here. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about this. And uh, there are sound, sound has a varying temperature and pressure. So if you send sound through some solution, where you have ions and, and molecules in mm -hmm. different concentrations, you can change the relative amounts of um, ions in there because the, um, the equilibrium, as you know this from high school chemistry, right? I think it's college chemistry. The equilibrium, the ions in there, depends upon the temperature and the pressure. So you can utilize that to pick up on sound. So again, what you want to get from this is it's limitless how you can transduce, and particularly electroweak, electroweak, electroacoustic transduction can be done in all kinds of ways. And here's kind of one of the bizarre ones. So the idea is that you could put, like, hey, you have a solution, and it's got, it's a solution of something, and it's got ions in there, right? And they're in equilibrium with the molecules. And you put two electrodes in there, right? You put a fixed voltage across there and you're going to get a current. When a sound wave comes by, it'll change the number of, um, of, of ions in there. When there's greater number of ions, you're going to have greater conductivity, so you get more current. You got a transducer. 
in principle, you have a transducer. May, actually getting it to work and you know, work well and reliably and calibrated, that's a whole other story, okay? So people, this has actually see, achieved some attention. You can look in the book, uh, I'm, Brian gets more involved in this, um, if you're interested, and he gets his references too, I think. Um, so I like this because it just shows how, you know, acousticians have come up with just, just about any kind of, if you've got coupling between acoustics and something else that you can make electric, you can, you, in principle, you can come up with a transducer. And again, you may not, it may be difficult or maybe it's not understood actually what's going on in there. So that's why people perform a lot of tests. For example, in this case, there's going to be some kind of reaction time. If that reaction time to create the, you know, to, for the ions to be created or go back into being combined with the electrons, if that time is long and compared to you know the acoustic the period of your acoustic wave, you're out of luck. You know you won't you won't see anything. So um, that's why if you don't know the basic physics of what's going, on, you better do a lot of tests. Okay, and that's apparently what the speaker did last week. Okay, I was hoping he would talk more about. It. I was interested in the in the vector sensor what was going on there, and all we got was oh, it's an accelerometer. Did you guys notice that? How many went to the talk? Yeah. So, but you'll notice he performed a lot of tests, right? <laughs> okay. So um, he meant, I think he mentioned that. So um, you know you, you're going to perform those tests regardless. But it's nice if you know the physics, as then you know where the problems can, can you, where you would expect the problems, rather than just being hit by them out of the blue and not being able, uh, be able to understand how you might possibly overcome them. Uh, okay, the final part here is, we've talked a little bit about this, here's a little more. In a transducer there's necessarily other uh, material in there that's not involved directly in the, transduce, in the transduction. It's just needed to keep the thing together and you know, to construct the thing. So here's the kind of non-transducing material we're talking about. There are, there are metals, you know, like um, some of these are vibrating parts, protective enclosure, mounting brackets, you know, you know you have to have that. There are things that need to stretch, right? Um, uh, and here's some examples here. I think there, I see a little overlap here, acoustic windows. Yeah, he's, uh, Brian is meaning um, things that are solids here, flexible solids. And then of course, as we already discussed a little bit today, liquids, right? Like the oil in the F-33. <coughs> and this can be, uh, in the design of a sonar device, this, this can be a big problem because to, you know, you know you have to use, what, what happens is you need to find out the properties of these, to find out the best one, the one that's sufficient to overcome the, the, the present difficulty you're having, okay? And um, one of the problems here is that you may not be able to find, you can try to look up the properties. You know, the elastic, elastic modulus, you can imagine what all kinds of, I think the properties are listed down below here. But there's all kinds of properties you may want to find. If you can't find them in the literature, then what do you do? Well, the first thing is you try to convince somebody else to find the properties, okay? <laughs> you might know somebody at the, you know, the National Institute of Standards or something like that, or you want to get somebody else to do it. But if, if, if you can't, then you're going to have to do it, you, you know? You're going to have to test them. And that can take a lot of time and money and energy. But, um, you know, we, we, we think we live in this highly technological society where everything's been documented. You'd be amazed what has not been documented. People get involved in research and they go down blind alleys. Do they document that? Yeah, to some extent, but it's usually not good enough. And if they do, you might, you might not have access to it. It's really unfortunate because um, it's not really efficient. When somebody goes down the wrong way or something, it would be nice if that information, that information should be available to everybody in the world, right? Um, so that they don't have to go through the same thing. 
but unfortunately, we don't we don't hear too much about the failures, which the successes that we hear about, right? So, um, so that, that's this. Yeah, here's the textbook list list different things, uh, mechan properties, electromechanical properties that you might be interested in, and these non non transducing materials. And liquids too. Um, another thing that plays a role here is cost. And you know, now that I think about it, cost here is not just the money. It's your time, right? And your energy. Yeah, that all comes into the balance here. So this is the end of the course. And I think one of the things you've probably convinced of in this course is, is that sonar trans transduction is it's a complicated <coughs> area of research, right? Not just theoretically, but experimentally. It's difficult in both ways. And it's important to appreciate, you know, different ways in which progress has been made. You, you want to you wanna be open-minded about transduction. You, you really have to be. Because seldom can you just, sometimes you can get away with it. You, you grab a transducer and you're thinking of it as a black box. Everybody's done this, okay? Because you're interested in something else. You just want it to work. But what you find in, in typical research environments is it's not so simple. You're going to have to know what's going on inside there. And you, because you may have to modify it. Or you may have to make your own. Okay, so if you need, uh, if you need, you can, I'll be around, of course, so any uh, lab report problems, come by and talk to me. And the quiz is due Thursday, right?